I agree. It's so nice to see on Twitter how much interest there is. Like I noticed that with my own account too. That there's there's real interest in tweeting about these topics. Like people from all over the world, um, many Muslim followers I have, they they seem to really like it, and yeah, that's really nice. Hello and welcome to episode seven of the Abbasid History Podcast. And the second of our ten-part series, speaking to women who study the pre-modern Islamicate past, the Hippocratic Oath is known to us all as the pledge doctors take before they embark on their career. His larger body of works, composed around the 54th century BC, form the basis for subsequent medical treatments. Hippocrates' aphorisms from his surviving corpus were subjected to extensive commentaries in Arabic from the 9th century onwards. Our guest today, Dr. Elaine van Dalen was part of a project at the University of Manchester which examined the Arabic commentary tradition on the aphorisms from the 9th to 16th century. She completed a PhD there in 2017, looking at rhetorical strategies in the Arabic commentaries on the Hippocratic aphorisms and exploring the meta discourse in medieval Arabic. She's currently assistant professor of classical Islamic studies in the Department of Middle East and South Asia and African Studies at Columbia University. And today we'll look at a published article in the Journal of the American Oriental Society on the paediatrics in medieval Islamic medical theory. Welcome, Dr. Van Dalen. Thank you. Your work on the Arabic commentaries on the Hippocratic aphorisms involved looking at 85 digitized manuscripts from 30 different libraries in 15 countries from around the world. That sounds like an exhausting task. Yes, well, that does make it sound more exhausting than it than it was because I was lucky enough to be part of a team where there were uh, several postdocs who worked on editing these manuscripts. So I was fortunate that I could draw from the editions that they prepared and I only occasionally had to check, but I didn't have to make editions of all these manuscripts and visit these libraries myself. Before we look at your study on the section specifically on childhood medicine from the Hippocratic aphorisms, let's look more generally at these aphorisms and, and the Arabic commentaries on them. Give us a description of these aphorisms first. Well, they are... Uh, major medical text uh, in the pre-modern world, both in the uh, East and West. Um, Hippocrates, well, they are attributed to Hippocrates, but most likely not all written by him. He collected these verses, medical verses, in seven in seven books. The first one is really well known: the aphorism that goes, uh, "Life is short, art long." etc. And of this nature, there's there are several themes in which uh, diseases, ailments are, are, are discussed, but very briefly. And hence, physicians such as first Galen in the second century AD began to explain the meaning and to give further interpretation on these short verses. And in the Islamic world, this tradition continued from the ninth century onwards. And we have commentary there as late as the 16th century. And tell us about some of the major Arabic commentaries you look at. So there's, for example, the commentary by the 13th century Christian uh, physician Ibn al-Quf. He is very, he tends to be very wordy, so he writes very long commentaries. There's also uh, Abdel Latif al-Baghdadi, who is also known for his account of, of Egypt in the 13th century. Those are two. There's Ibn Abi Sadiq, who was called the second Hippocrates, and, and many, many other lesser known Arab physicians. And in your article, I think you look around 10 of these commentaries. Yes. Um, yes, um, all why, that were available to me. Um, why did you decide to focus on paediatrics for your recent article? I thought it was a good case study to look at the different ways that these physicians used Galenic medical theory and material. Mm -hmm. So it was a good topic to illustrate this. And in addition to that, pediatrics also really clearly showed the divide between or the difference between different uh, medical genres. So the commentaries in this respect are very theoretical and they differ from other genres such as the 
encyclopedia, such as even seeing a scanner, for example, in, in pediatrics, it's it's much more practical and it, and it includes and treatments. And the commentaries are very different in nature. They focus on explaining why diseases happen and why uh, they happen at a certain time to a certain person, and they give theoretical explanations for that. They're not so much engaged in theory. So, so this topic of pediatrics really shows that genre-specific uh, theoretical focus. And there are only five aphorisms dealing with pediatrics. Would you care to list them for us or to describe them to us? Yeah, so there's there's five aphorisms in book in the third collection of the aphorisms that deal with children diseases. This is the book where Hippocrates first describes the four seasons and the diseases that happen in the four seasons, and then he continues describing the four seasons of of the, the human age, so youth, old, uh, young age, older age, and, and then old age. Uh, so then he begins in these five aphorisms to say first what well, what happens to very young and newborn children, and he says they they have mouth ulcers and they have running ears. And then he continues to point out the diseases that happen to to slightly older children when they when they're teething. Children that tease tend to be constipated, he says. And then older children again in, in, in aphorism twenty six, they they have inf- inf- infected tonsils a lot. And then children with puberty, they they tend to get chronic fevers so that's a summary of these of the first four and then in the fifth it's more of a general explanation of when children reach the the crisis in their disease which was which is like the height of the disease when it when it reached its worst point after that or be cured and you argue in your article that the medieval islamic tradition didn't just relay information from the greeks but also interacted with it to synthesize original insights into the causes and natures of disease. And and we'll explore that today by looking closely at at readings of this section. And we're going to make the aphorism available on our website's show notes. We realize these commentators can have a critical relationship with these aphorisms, including just at the stage of classification. Yes, yeah, so well, some commentators follow Galen's classification, where the second stage of childhood begins with teething. We see other commentators uh, use their own classification, such as Abdelatif al Baghdadi. He argues that the second stage of childhood begins not with teething, but with weaning. So, after usually the second year of a child's age. And so, let's look at Galen, because Galen becomes very important for these Arabic commentators, such that uh, he becomes his commentary on Hippocrates becomes almost like a mutton or a text in itself. Yeah. So t- tell us about this relationship with Galen. Yes, there's a lot to say about that because he is very important. So what the later Arabic com- commentators do, they do not only explain Hippocrates' text, the the text they're actually commenting on, but they also explain. Galen's commentary on that text. And my, my colleague, Kamran Karimola, has showed it in an article that as time continues, Galen's textual presence in that tradition decreases. So where he's quoted a lot at the beginning, he's not quoted so much anymore in later commentaries. But in the beginning, he is quoted a lot and they, they go uh, to great lengths to explain his words, but they don't always agree with him. And he's not always himself complete in his explanation. So when he isn't, they either use his theory to offer their own explanation, but that, that, that doesn't involve any paradigm shift, so that continues the Galenic view of the child, or they, they break with that completely and they have different explanations that, that cannot be considered Galenic. And so an example of how the commentators clarify or expand on Galen uh, is in the, with regards to thrush and terrors and, 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 and spasms. Would you like to expand on that? Yes, okay. So, so Galen explains that, that thrush happens because of the orodes, the way in, in milk, which Hanadin Ibn Ishaq 
the ninth century famous incredibly translator he translates this with rutuba ma'iya in arabic which means watery moisture so um, in Hunayn's translation of galen's commentary it says that children experience thrush or they have little ulcers in, in, in on the palate of their mouths because of the watery moisture in milk now that translation that Hunayn made was very important for later physicians working after him so they you see that they 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 refer to Galen's translate to, to Galen's commentary using Hunayn's translation but they do not agree with his translation of watery moisture so they offer their own explanation for example that milk contains uh, fadalad residues or because uh, it it contains something uh, called borax which which hurts the mouth right so you see that they they follow the initial idea that there's something in milk but then they 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 um and this is not uh, well they ch they change what what they think is that is that aspect of milk that's bad and with regards to Hunayn i did want to ask the the translators of these original texts were they trained as physicians themselves or did they have any kind of background in in what they were translating uh yes that's a very interesting question because yes Hunayn was a physician himself and all the other commentators were physicians themselves too okay but they were also very much trained in linguistic linguistics and philological studies and that's always the paradox that you see uh, uh, in Galen's work too, he was a physician himself, but he also engaged in a lot of philological work, which f didn't always get get him as much credit. Now, that's something I explore in my in the monograph I'm working on too. Is that that changes uh, with physicians such as Abdel Latif al Baghdadi? He was trained first and foremost as a grammatician, so he worked as a grammatician first, and then later he picked up medicine and. So he, he worked as a physician, he worked as a grammatician, and both of these tasks were equally important for him. There was no, there was no shame in, in, in one of the other, as, as perhaps uh, Galen had to defend himself uh, before. And there are also cases when Galen has not given an ex explanation or his interpretation is rejected. And in these cases, all authors either fill in the gap with Galenic material taken from elsewhere, provide new explanations that follow Galenic doctrine, or more rarely they break away the Galenic theory altogether. Yes, so for example, in the case of convulsions, uh, Galen explains this as being due to uh, the, that children experience uh, when, they, when they go through teething. And uh, that's that's accepted by by some uh, Arab Arabic authors. But then when we come to Asinjari, uh, one of the commentators he rejects Galen's explanation, but he offers a new explanation that still uses uh, Galenic theory, right? So he uses the Galenic theory, which in turn derives from uh, Hippocrates of of, of phyto heat, arguing that these convulsions occur because the vital heat, which is a natural heat that everybody contains. This was an old uh, theory about the human body that they that they adhere to. Uh, the, this vital heat is immersed in in a ch in a child's body because they have large amounts of fluids, right? right? They're wet, according to Galen. So, Asanjari adopts this idea that children are wet, and then he takes his other theory of the phyto heat, and they say because children are very wet in, and they're weak, uh, they, this this phyto heat is immersed in them, and that uh, irritates their matter, and this is why they have convulsions. So what he does is he breaks with Galen's explanation of why convulsions happen, but he relies completely on Galenic theory to offer a new explanation. Uh, and and Asinjari. Abul Hussein, he lived in the 1100s, correct? Right. Um, we don't know much about him, but yeah, probably he did. And then there are examples of when the commentators 
almost have a kind of paradigm shift and they reject the Galenic framework. Do you want to give examples of that? Yes. So this is the last um, example of uh, ways in which the commentators engage with Galen uh, material. In terms of, uh, in relation to sleeplessness, Galen uh, relates, so he says, when the room uh, drink milk that has gone bad, they uh, they will wake up a lot and they will suffer from sleeplessness. And there are some um, Arab commentators that do follow this explanation, but there is one commentator, the 14th century Asiwasi, who rejects this completely and also rejects the idea of a physical explanation for sleeplessness because he says sleeplessness happens to these children because they feel lonely it happens when um, they're not close to people okay. so uh, when they're not near their family they, they they wake up so he searches for a social or psychological reason uh, which uh, which is quite unique uh, compared to galen and the other arabic commentator you mentioned something in your article which i think deserves perhaps to be expanded upon another time and that's a seemingly gendered division between the theoretical and practical so for example Ali bin Sahal Rabban al-Tabarali who died in 870 he, ma- he makes an interesting confession about who thinks are the real experts on infant medicine yes so uh, Ali Rabban and tabari so the, the author of um, the one of the earliest medical Encyclopedias in Arabic, the Paradise of Wisdom, the Fidaus al Hikmah. He writes when he's talking about children's diseases that he shouldn't talk about it too much because he, uh, women, wet nurses, and old ladies, they know much more about the topic than he does. And he and, distinguishes between a, a tibba and a different class of people. Yeah, so that's the, the tabib is, is the, the, the physician who's engaged in theoretical thinking and the mutatabib is, is the practitioner who does practical things. Now, Giladi, Avna Giladi, he makes a distinction between between these genders, right, that, that men would, would engage in the theoretical side of children's uh, and women would, would engage themselves with, with, with the practical care of children. Are we, aware, addition, are we aware of any medical treatises written by women from this time? At this no, time we're in not medical aware, care? unfortunately. Uh, Ali Robanetabi mentions them, but otherwise uh, these, these texts are all written by, claimed to be written by men at least. But so this distinction is not only between gender, there's also this distinction between genre so it's not true that these physicians didn't care about the practicalities of child care if you look at uh, avicenna's canon ibn Zina's canon it's full of of practical remedies and and advice how to treat children how to sing for newborn children how to take care of them uh well on the other hand the commentaries are void of such uh practical aspects right so among medical genres there's a difference here too uh, and it's not only uh, the case that uh, male doctors would write where the female wet nurses would take care of children. Male doctors also engaged in in practical matters, except that they, do, or at least they wrote about these matters, except they don't do so in the commentary. So there's a very interesting division between the genres in this respect. And the medical commentaries uh, resemble the scriptural commentaries in the apparatus of, of matan, uh, the text, and, and the sharh, the explanation. What does this speak to us about constructions of knowledge in these Islamicate cultures? It resembles the scriptural commentaries, but it also resembles the scientific tradition that was older, so... The medical commentaries follow a tradition that came from from the Greek world too, right? But I think one thing that it can tell us that for a lot of new knowledge production, we need to turn to commentaries and not think that commentaries are derivative or secondary text. Right. So the commentaries produced in the classical Islamic period and they are not always studied as much. And that's, of course, beginning to change. But... Um, 
I think the idea that these commentaries are secondary mm -hmm. text is is um, uh, it's false, and it it prevents people from really seeing the wealth of of knowledge production that that these texts contain. And we do find sometimes the Arabic commentaries can also be our only sources for knowing about lost earlier Greek works. Uh, yeah, yes, that does happen. Um, as example, with the Palladius commentary, Palladius was a seventh or fifth century, probably sixth century Greek physician who wrote a commentary on also these Hippocratic aphorisms. Everyone was writing commentaries on these aphorisms, but it was lost. It's not extant anymore, and it was translated in a very a loose way with a lot of original text by an anonymous Arabic translator, probably in the ninth century, it's an early translation. So in Arabic, we have, um, well, that's only two of the seven books that are accents. So in Arabic, we have some evidence of Palladius text. And the even more fun thing about this story is that uh, this Arabic text, this translation slash new uh, creation was translated twice at least into hebrew in southern france um in the 13th century and of this hebrew translation we still have the full seven books so to really know um about Palladius commentary you need to go through the arabic translation to the hebrew translation and then reconstruct um, the original part again okay whenever i have guests who know other languages i'm always keen to ask them how they would recommend someone who studied arabic first how to learn those other languages what would you recommend in learning ancient greek um for learning ancient greek um so i did this first in in uh using Dutch textbooks when I was in secondary school. But uh, I remember in Manchester, we used the reading Greek grammar and exercises textbook. So working through that. And I think most of all being committed to it and doing daily little bits of studying would be fruitful. Um, and you also know Hebrew as well. Yeah, so for Hebrew, again, I studied mostly in, uh, in Dutch. Uh, but I uh, really love uh, John and Mura Oka's uh, grammar of biblical Hebrew that will not help you if you're looking at medieval Hebrew grammar um, very much or if you want to anyway, yeah. And would you have any recommendations for, for um, yeah, medieval Hebrew? I have Hebrew? one that I use for rabbinical Hebrew but there is Fernandes and uh, Awoldes introductory grammar of rabbinic Hebrew. Okay. And then for Syriac, which is also a very important language if you want to study history of Arabic uh, science, there there is Robinson's paradigms and exercises in Syriac grammar. And then what I will ask finally is with, is with regards to um, introductions, introductory texts to medieval Arabic sciences and medical history in particular um yes yeah, so for medicine i would recommend emily savage smith and peter perman's uh, interesting survey of islamic medicine called uh, islamic medicine which is uh, published by edinburgh university press i think 2007 uh, and before that there's manfred Oman also wrote in german uh, a book on islamic medicine which has been translated to english so there's those two on medicine. Then there is Gutas's uh, work on the translation, which is very interesting. There's uh, there's George Saliba's book on the making of the European Renaissance. That's a very nice introduction to it. Focuses more on astronomy. Uh, so I think those are three, four nice books to start with. You applied to Manchester to your PhD. Did you have interest in medical history or, or the history of science b before that? I did have an interest in the ninth century classical Islamic world. Like I knew about the wealth of, of knowledge production that were taking place there. So I did find that an interesting time period. But I was doing modern Middle East studies for my master's first. Uh -huh. So when I 
applied to this, I was not doing medicine and I did not know myself much about the aphorisms or Hippocrates at all. There was this PhD position that was very specifically working on these commentaries and I did get the position. And so, so this is the thing because when people apply for, for PhDs, uh-huh. I, I guess there's like choice between doing what you want to do and doing what someone else wants to do. And I, and I was wondering whether that bothered you because it seems like such a departure from what you're doing before yeah well i'm i mean mean, yeah you can do two things you can of course apply to a position where you can design your own project and there's the option where you follow in someone else's project i see i still had some liberty to change it but i think i am i mean i'm not going to lie that it was sometimes difficult because it was not my immediate interest at first yeah. but I'm also very happy that I had to do it because it also showed me this amazing super fascinating world of medicine and you know classical Islamic science which I would not necessarily have come to otherwise so right, right now I love what I do and if I hadn't done this PhD perhaps I wouldn't have well, maybe I would also have gotten there. But sometimes it's okay to not choose yourself at first because it can open up a lot of n- new roads of of scholarship. It is a very specialised and, and sometimes quite difficult subject because when I was researching the notes for this conversation, there was a lot, to, especially some of the medical terms. Like Some of them I didn't understand what they were and I had to look, look mm-hmm. those up. And then to do that in a foreign language based upon a scientific understanding which is so alien to our own yes sounds very challenging yes i am very <laughs> that's really nice of you to acknowledge because that's true like you're not only working on on some on, on science in itself that's difficult but you're also working on on greek and arabic so you have that those different languages that you need to understand everything in two you have a topics that are I mean, I guess it's easier for me to follow than con- contemporary medicine would be. Like, they're not always that complicated, but it is a new, it, it is a mer- medical paradigm that you need to familiarize yourself with. Plus, you're also working with text, a textual tradition where there's still a, f- a lot of philological work needed. So you still need to work with med- manuscripts and check readings, um, pr- prepare editions. So there's that aspect of the work as well. So it does take time. But it's fun too. So, because when I was looking at your PhD, it seemed you you were working mainly from manuscripts. Yeah. Well, so the the, um, the that's the project that Peter Portman got the grant for was to collect all these manuscripts from all over the world and to make editions. Right. So that's what they did. And as I did my PhD, they had already started that, I think maybe a year before I came, maybe some PDF files ready for me to work with. And often mm-hmm. I had to go check it with one or two or three manuscripts, but myself, that wasn't my task necessarily. So so were you reading from, the, were you reading from digitized copies of the manuscript or by that stage had those manuscripts been made into they always, print editions. We, yeah so i normally worked with editions like pdf files that were they were like typed oh okay transcribed copies of the manuscripts and then we also had the digital copies of the manuscripts themselves if you wanted to check reading between multiple manuscripts then, then i could access those digitized manuscripts and that's what the postdocs worked with too. It's not like we would go or go to to head on or Istanbul and ask for digital copies of their manuscripts. Like I don't think we owned many of the manuscripts ourselves. Cool. Uh, and what kind of things are you doing now? You said you've got a monograph coming out. Yeah, so I'm working on on my mono- making my 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 thesis into a book. Okay. Uh, which will be on the commentaries, but more broadly, like the way medical knowledge was produced. Okay. That question of how um, how physicians were also linguists, uh, but a lot philologists, and how uh, the humanities and the 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 hard sciences were were not so much separated as they are today, and that they worked together in knowledge production at the time. So that was what my book will 
<laughs> center on. I wish I had written more on it this summer, but and that sounds fascinating. Once you have that out, you must come back again. I will. It will be my pleasure. And before we end, uh, tell us how it was like going from Manchester to now being at New York. Going from Manchester. Well, that was a, a long journey because I went first to Edinburgh for a few months and then I went to Brussels for a year and then I moved to New York. So, yeah, it had, it is, it's been a lot of changes, but yeah, it's been good. New York's a great place. Manchester was nice, too. And I feel privileged to be able to work in such inspiring environments. That's a great way to end. Uh, Dr. Van Dana, thank you. For nice. And thank you for having me on your on your podcast. Thank you. Don't be 